our gracious Heavenly Father. I so adore you for your grace and your mercy and your love that you've shown toward us. So thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to just come together, never having really met in person, but to feast upon your word and to fellowship together over the marvelous truths of your grace. I ask that you would filter out anything that's ignorant or foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which you would have us know. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to finish our study in the book of Revelation in this video. Before moving on to a verse-by-verse -verse study through the epistle to the Philippians. So I want to welcome you. Uh, invite you to join us as we go through the marvelous book of Philippians together. Not knowing how much time that we have left here before the Lord brings us home, it's important that we continue on in our study of His Word, which enriches our souls, which comforts our spirit, the comforts of grace, to carry us through to our final day here. I want to focus in on one particular verse at the closing of the 22nd chapter of Revelation, verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book and if any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy the book of this prophecy God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book I am absolutely positive that this verse is one these two verses 18 and 19 have probably troubled Christians all down through the centuries. I think we have to, to step lightly through these two verses and we have to understand, try the best, to the best of our ability, folks, to understand the thought that the Holy Spirit was trying to convey here to us. The warning is severe. And many questions arise as a result of our reading these two verses. We could ask a lot of questions, okay? I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. The wounds, that's the word wounds in the original text. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So apparently his name is in the book of life. Uh, the the question here is and it's always been the question is is this referring strictly to the book of Revelation the book of this prophecy is what the text says it would appear on the surface that this is strictly limited to the book of Revelation you don't see this warning given in any other book of the Bible. So right away, it's tempting, at least on our part, to ask, well, why here, not elsewhere? 
Now, of course, that's a subject of debate, which could be, one could argue that, well, that warning is given in other books, such as the book of Galatians, concerning uh, doctrine itself and the twisting and the perverting of Scripture, the twisting of doctrine, uh, changing God's words to, to make it sound like he, he's saying something other than what he's saying, or adding to those words, uh, words that he didn't say, and you could you could you could make that argument. I I think you could make that argument. You could clearly make that argument. You could clearly make the argument that this is extends this warning that we see here at the end closing of the book of Revelation actually extends itself uh, or is is applicable to all of Scripture. The book of this prophecy. Uh, nearly two-thirds of the Bible is prophecy. And if you remember back in the 19th chapter of Revelation, where John fell at the feet of this angel to worship him and he said unto him see thou do it not i am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of jesus the testimony of jesus and if you could you just stop if you stop right there and you think you ask yourself what was what is the testimony of jesus what is his testimony and if you've been a follower of this ministry for some time, I think you know where, where my position is on, on, on the answer to that question of, of what is his testimony. Uh, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And, and we're looking at if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Okay. Chapter 19, verse 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, before we go on and, and look at the last two verses, verses 20 and 21, I want to spend a few moments just thinking about this, getting, getting us all to think about this warning of nothing being added or taken away. Because right away, right away in the mind of the, uh, I'll, I'll, I will say, the, even the most sincere Christian, right away, there's a sense of of concern here when reading the word th these two verses and there should be uh, the Holy Spirit chose to place these two verses here at this particular point the it's the You've only got two final verses that conclude the book of Revelation, which concludes the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible. This is Christ himself speaking here. It's not, as I pointed out, the Paul's logic, Paul's reasoning. Now, I'm not going to argue with you that, that Paul didn't have this same concern but what he he merely held the pen it was the holy spirit i don't think paul or i don't think john understood i hope i didn't say paul i meant john i don't think john understood much of what he wrote in the book of revelation if any man shall add unto these things okay now let's stop and think about this of all of the translations that we have that, that are available to us in, the, in our modern age, there's, a, there's over 500 English translations alone. Of all the commentaries that have been written, 
of all the articles that have been written, of all of the different various interpretations that have been given, okay, of all of these verses, not just in the book of Revelation, but in the entire body of Scripture, are we to say, are we to think that if, if our interpretation of these passages is wrong, and keep in mind, keep in mind, I don't see how we can do one and not do the other. If any man shall add unto these things, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of the, I don't see how we can do one without doing the other. If we do one, we're going to be doing the other. And I understand that the text says, if any man, any man. Okay, so you could make the argument, and I'm not going to fault anyone for making that argument. But Steve, this is talking about any man, whether they're one of God's elect or, or, or they're not one of God's elect. It, the text says any man, if any man, that, that includes you and that includes me, shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. I think we've got a little thinking to do here when it comes to these last two verses. Dearly beloved, this ministry began on the basis of God's grace, God's abounding mercy, His love, His grace for His people. Just, just a, a cursory reading of Scripture will bear out the simple truth, the fact that we have, and, and I, I, I hate to bring in some, I don't know, some, some, there's a country song with Josh Turner called The Long Black Train. You know, the devil's driving the long black train. We don't, you don't want to be on the long black train. Is, is, is a violation of these last two verses, is that going to put you on that long black train? I'm going to suggest to you that you've already been taken off of that long black train. That the train's already left the station. There's nowhere along the path in, along the, the, the pathway of your life in which you are going to, to be to find yourself uh, in any possibility where the, God has allowed for any possibility of you ever boarding that long black train. You've been taken out of Adam, you've been placed into Christ. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me, I give them eternal life, they'll never perish, no one will snatch them out of my hand, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand except you who violate these two verses here and add or take away to the words of this prophecy. Am I supposed to tell you people that? that? Is that what I'm supposed to tell you? All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Never, I will never, oh, I'll, I will never cast out except unless you come to the end of the very, the book of Revelation after, after, after finding yourselves comforted by the truths of God's grace, love, and mercy for I, I don't know how many years. And then you come to the end of the, of the very, the end of the book of Revelation. And now all of a sudden, now, oh, but that's changed. Is that what I'm supposed to tell you people? I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Whoever hears my word. I just, I just pointed out Revelation 19.10. He's the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He has eternal life. Well, how long is eternal life? How long is eternal life? Is it just until you, you come to the end of the book of Revelation and, and you, you somehow you've, you've managed to, to wrangle through these, these, 
these these complicated verses in the in the book of revelation and you've misinterpreted some of these verses and you've added to to something that was not there or you've taken away from from some words that, that were there and so now you're in danger of hellfire and you're on that long black train headed to hell is that what i'm supposed to tell you people For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And I'm supposed to tell you that you come to the end of the book of Revelation. And here's this dire warning that if you don't have your act together, and if somehow you manage to pervert, twist, distort, corrupt these words of God, this testimony of Jesus Christ, and, and what is that testimony of Jesus Christ? What is it? I'm going to suggest to you, dear, dearly beloved people, of God, souls for whom, whom Christ died, I'm going to suggest to you that that's the spirit of prophecy is not just limited to this book. And the warning is not just limited to this book, even though it may sound like it, it is. And maybe in the strictest sense, maybe in the immediate context, it is referring to the book of Revelation. But I'm going to suggest to you that we're looking at something far more grander than this and something far more comforting than this. It, it usually turns out that the verses in the Bible, folks, that scare you the most are if when you look at them and you take them and understand them the way God presented them, it, you'll usually find out, if not always, you'll find out that they turn out to be the most comforting verses that you've ever read. We simply cannot say, as Paul, that I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, except verses what are they, 18 and 19 here? The verses, the two verses that we're looking at, 18 and 19 of the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation with only two verses left to go to finish the entire book. I can't do that. Now, maybe others can, but I can't. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Who, is, who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. For by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. We're getting ready to go into Philippians verse 6 of the first chapter. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. For if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Yet we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, Oh mercy. We're going to we're going to ignore all of that. Throw all that out. Toss all of that out when we come to the to these final few verses in the book of Revelation and we're going to say Man, we better watch it. We better watch ourselves or we're going to find ourselves on that long black train going nowhere. And I I can't do that. What the question in my mind, folks, because it was by a single offering that he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You, we have an enormous, we have these verses here that I'm talking about, I'm referring to here, that stand upon a mountain of verses, a mountain of scripture. that provides joy and peace and grace and comfort in the lives of God's people. 
And what was it about... Uh, let's think back. Think back on every single time you found comfort, joy, peace, rest, strength, all of that, the love of God in, in the Word of God. And any time that's had an imp, those truths have had an impact in your life. What was it? I guess I'm 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 really mud, muddying the waters here. What was it about these truths, these these comforting truths of grace? What was it? What was it centered upon? What was it based upon? Well, it was based upon the finished, the perfect finished work of Christ. I don't know how many times I've said that, that it, at the judgment seat of Christ, our life's work singular is judged. It's, we are judged on how we built on Christ. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals Jesus Christ. Not just a whole bunch of stuff about Jesus Christ. Or a whole bunch of stuff about a seven-year period called the, the Tribulation. Or Daniel's 70th week. It's, it's, what have we seen as we've gone through this book? What have we seen? We've seen God's love, His mercy, His, His forgiveness in the letters to the seven churches, His grace abounded toward these believers. We, that's, that's how it started out. We've seen God's mercy, His love toward His people. We've seen His promise of, of coming judgment. We've seen the trustworthiness of God, that God, the God who cannot lie. We've seen where that His justice, these, what would seem to some would be unmerciful acts of God's vengeance against these poor creatures that, you know, they just can't help it, you know, and they, they just, they don't deserve, I mean, God is not going to send people to hell to burn forever you know, for something that, you know, Adam did or whatever. You know, the arguments, all of those fallacious arguments that could be made. Which is a good point because it, 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 I believe it drives to, it is driving to the point that I'm trying to make here. And that is to change or alter the words of this book or to add, add to this book is to add to the perfect finished work of Christ. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. What are we doing when we're adding or taking away? Ask yourselves that. I, I almost want to say that the Galatians, what Paul says in Galatians, if, if, if any man preach another gospel other than that which you have received, let him be accursed. I almost want to say that's a parallel passage to, to the, what we're looking at here. This, that the same thought... The Holy Spirit is trying to convey the same thought through Paul in Galatians that he's doing with John right here. Adding or taking away from the books of this prophecy. Well, it's it's just these things are just too hard to believe. I mean, I can't, I can't, I I'm, I know I'm reading all this stuff here in, in this in this book of Revelation. This her, all this horrendous stuff. And it's just, it's just, it's more than I can comprehend. It's more than I can bear. God's really not going to do all, this is a bunch of symbolic stuff. And it's, it's just not, it's not, it's not to be interpreted literally. I mean, it's, and, and, and much of it has already been done in the past anyway. So this is all history. It's, it, there's nothing really yet future to be fulfilled here. And Christians do that. It's an important fact to take note of here, folks. I can do that. You can do that. You can take and misinterpret the words of any verse in the Bible. We, in fact, we do that all the time. No man has a handle on the truth. So it cannot be saying that if you misinterpret these verses, if you add or take away, if you... And then there are those who argue that, well, you know, John, you know, he had a deep, 
deep concern that, that there, since he knew that there would be copies made of this book and they would be distributed to the churches, that you know he had a great concern that there would be people who would, who would look at all of this phenomenal stuff, this almost unbelievable revelation about the, the, the coming judgment and the return of Christ. And some of this stuff was so far over the top, you know, that, that many people would just not believe it. And so the, they'd strike this out. Or they'd, they'd change it and they'd add to it something that's, that's not there. And you could argue that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to fault anyone for thinking that John perhaps felt that way. But I remind you again that John is not the author, but, but the author is the Holy Spirit. John simply wrote what the Holy Spirit wanted written. And this, this, the Holy Spirit, through John, wrote what Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's his testimony, and he is the spirit of prophecy. I think the warning is dire, but I don't think it's limited to just what we're reading in these, these 22 chapters. That's what I'm going to suggest. Now, I could be wrong. And if you have, and if you have the, uh, another view that, well, Steve, this is only limited to the book of Revelation, I'm not going to fault you for that. If that's what you, you believe, I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that at all. I do think, however, that we're looking at something far grander than this. I think that displayed in the very, the, the very words, what comes out of the very words of these two verses that I just read, 18 and 19. What is splashed across the, these two verses is something much deeper than just misinterpreting a, a verse or a passage of Scripture or writing the wrong commentary on it, you know or writing the wrong article, holding the wrong viewpoint of it. For us to take away from what Christ did for us on the cross, to add it, to put in its place, to add to the Scripture something that's not there, that would suggest that we had to somehow, that in the final analysis, that it came down to us whether or not we were going to, you know, which train we were going to board, the long black train or that glory bound train. And it's all up to you. And in the final analysis, doesn't matter about all the grace and all the love and the peace and the joy and the rest and the fellowship and the sufferings of Christ and being raised from the dead with him, crucified, buried, raised from the dead with Christ to walk in newness of life, not in oldness of the letter. Forget all of that. Forget it. It's all made null and void by these two verses right here. Seriously? He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And that word quickly is that at God's appointed time, without delay, we are at the end of the book. There's no, there's no more delay. There's a comfort in him coming. Okay, well, okay, so let's back up again now. These, let's look at these two verses as condition. They're conditional, okay? The believer's eternal destiny depends upon how he handles verses 18 and 19. God forbid he should ever take away from this book or add to this book. But now I'm going to comfort you by saying I'm coming quickly. Yeah, I guess the argument would be, you know, well, okay, he's coming quickly. So I, I hope that you can somehow we've got to make sure that we keep ourselves in line because he's coming quickly and maybe we'll be in line when he comes. Seriously. Folks, dearly beloved, is that how you read scripture? If that's how you, you read scripture, then you miss this being about the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is the very 
heading title of the book itself. You're going to study your whole life. You're going to labor. You're going to spend countless hours in prayer and meditation and study on God's Word and miss seeing Jesus Christ. Dearly beloved, this is what we cannot do. Because if, if we do that, we're going to wind up adding unto these things. We're going to wind up taking away from the things that are written in this book. It's, it, it doesn't... There is a, a soft, gentle, warm embrace. Just call it a hug by our Lord and Master, our Savior, Jesus Christ. A warm embrace that we receive from Him through our day-to-day -day walk every single time. We glorify Him and not ourselves. There's where the comfort is. That's, there is no comfort in the lie that says that somehow in the final analysis, you know, it, it all depends upon us. What a horrifying way to live your life as a believer. And yet many do. And then we read, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Now, of course, you know, I can, I can understand people saying, yeah, well, this was John. Exile on the Isle of Patmos, you know, it's, it's uh, no telling all the suffering that he, he was going through at that time i mean it's easy to, to it's a lot easier to you know to say come lord jesus when things are not going so well what about saying come lord jesus when everything is going just fine when you're in good health your finances are okay you got the the love of your life your kids love you your grand kids they hop in your lap they love you they hug your neck they love you to death your your boss even likes you i mean everything's going well the car's running you know you don't you don't have to to go very far to drive to the store i mean you've got the perfect picture perfect life and and are you going to say come lord jesus <coughs> <coughs> I don't see there in the text anywhere where it says, well, if you're troubled, if you're sorrowful, if you're going through extreme hardships and difficulties, then, then come by all means. Come Lord Jesus. Why would we even say that? Come Lord Jesus. If there was any sense of dread, if there was any sense of discomfort, if there was any sense whatsoever of uncertainty as to where we stood in our relationship with the Lord. No wonder verse 21 ends with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And, it, and that verse almost brings tears to my eyes for several reasons. One, because the it's, it's over. We're finished. The Bible, I, we're at the end of it. Okay, now you, you got a choice. You can start back in Genesis and start all over again. Or you can go through a little sadness that there's not anything beyond Revelation. But the real emotion of verse 21, and forget the fact that it's 21 and we're in the year 21, just forget that nonsense and just focus on, on the real truth, the heart of the matter, is that is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Will it or will it not? Will it? Will His grace carry us through to the end? And of course, we know from all the rest of Scripture, we know that it will. And you can take tremendous joy and tremendous comfort in that fact. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, was you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit.
I've heard phrases like, you know, the comfort of grace, the comfort of Calvinism, the comfort of, you know, this, the comfort of that. And, you know, you can phrase it any way you want, but there's the only comfort, folks, that you will ever find in your life is not just in understanding the words of this book. No, no. Because there'll be many times where you don't understand the words to this book. And it's, it shouldn't be surprising that God would understand something that you don't. The comfort, dearly beloved, is spending time in His Word. To meditate on it. To pray about it. To think about it. To walk around. To walk wherever you go during... The, the time that you spend in your day to walk around with His Word in your heart and in your mind. To think about it. To glory in it. Because it, it all, everything, 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 everything points to Christ. Points you to Christ. To look to Christ. Not yourself, not your sin, not yourself, your circumstances here below. Okay? We walk by faith, not by sight. And I love you all. I truly do. It saddens me in a way to, to, to come to the end of any book because, uh, and I know that there's other places we can go, but it's always been a, a little bit of a sadness to me to come to to the end of a book because you always want to know more I want to thank you all for all of the, the time that you spend to to message me to leave comments kind encouraging comments I want you to know that I'm, I'm constantly praying for you all I ask for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry until next time this is Steve. Thanks for watching.